so that they know of it. If you just read the whole thing. Yep, yeah, seven o'clock. Yeah, are we ready? Yeah. Oh, I think we're on. Good evening, and welcome to the August 14th, 2019 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. If you could all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I do roll call. Cameron Chu. Here. James Hebert. Here. Melinda Torrance. Here. Rudy Cameron. Here. David Bork. Here. Chip Howe. Here. Jennifer Waters. Here. Thank you and welcome. Good evening. This is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes to go in an executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and viewed, all the exhibits that are being presented tonight. Please notify the chairperson if you are unable to hear or to see the proceeding. The board works from a prepared agenda, agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. We will approve the minutes from last meeting and the written decisions from the last meeting. And then we have two appeals tonight. First, the appeal number 2662 in regards to 6 Champion Street and appeal number 2664 in regards to 20 Dillon Drive. <coughs> In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chairperson will close the record and the board will adopt finding of facts for each criteria in the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet the criteria. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the board must deny, deny the appeal or application. In many cases, the applicant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the applicant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion must be made to approve the appeal, and if there is a second, discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the finding of fact to support a decision on the motion. A general vote will then take place on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members prevent, uh, present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date of the vote was taken regardless of the approval of the final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of the board's decision. Again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding and you have the right to hear and see what is happening tonight. All persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address or affiliation and all board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions through the chair, which is me. So first, we're going to approve the minutes from the meeting from July 10th, 2009. Did all the board members get a chance to review those minutes? Yes. yes. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll approve the minutes as presented from July 10th. A second. All in favor? We have the approval of the draft written decision for the appeal <coughs> for Highland Ave Greenhouse. Did everyone get a chance to review the finding of facts and conclusions? Mm -hmm. Any questions yes. or comments or concerns? Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the draft um, decisions for appeal number 2661 for Highland Avenue Greenhouse. I'll second. All Before in you. favor? And then we have the draft written decisions for the practical difficulty variants by Kevin and Margaret Buckley for One Crossing Drive. Did everyone get a chance to review those? Yes. Yes. Any questions, concerns? Do I have a motion? I'll motion. move. No, go for it. <laughs> I'll move to approve the uh, draft written decisions for appeal number 2663. And I will second. All in favor? Okay, 
Our first appeal tonight is appeal number 2662, which is a variance appeal that's going to be presented by the, the design company on behalf of Champion Realty Trust. It's in regards to 6 Champion Street, which is Assessor's Map U1, Lot 87. I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff from the town to please give us a little background on this appeal. Sure. So the... Uh... <coughs> The appellant owns a, a 0.12 acre parcel in the coastal residential district. Um, it's also in the shoreland overlay. It's also in a special flood hazard area, AO depth one foot, frontal dune D1, and an erosion hazard area. So it's a small non-conforming lot with very little space on the lot. Um, it's non-conforming with the space and bulk standards, obviously, in the district, and the existing structure is also <coughs> non-conforming with regard to side yard, front yard, uh, or rather shoreland setbacks. Um, I think the applicant is going to present um, an appeal to allow him to d demolish the existing structure and replace it or reconstruct a new structure and also apply the 30% expansion allowances for area and volume to the new structure. Um, that's it. Okay. Mr. Wilson. Good evening. How are you? Okay. I don't know if you want to give us a brief rundown or... You know, yeah, I can. Um, I know you've got the written packet that I gave you. There was a couple <coughs> of changes that took place in the descriptions on the property, primarily to the A zone, whether it's AO, A13, right. whatever it is. Um, well, I'm here representing uh, Champion Realty Trust in the application for the Board of Appeals for a variance to demolish and replace the existing residential building at 6 Champion Street, pursuant to Section 12C3 of the zoning, Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Properties identified in the Scarborough tax, tax maps is uh, Map U1-87 is located in the CDCR1 Higgins Beach Character Zone. According to the Scarborough Tax Assessor's record, records, the existing residence was constructed in 1966. The property itself has access to Champion Street, uh, Street over an easement across the abutters property and has beach frontage on the Atlantic Ocean. There is no actual street frontage on this lot. The property, prox, property is approximately 50 feet wide and extends 105 feet to the ocean but a concrete seawall bisects the property, resulting in a usable lot size of approximately 50 feet by 73 feet. Attached property survey by Northeast Civil Solutions identifies the built existing buildings and property lines. The site is also affected by several overlay districts from the town of Scarborough and other government agencies. These distri districts include ordinances and regulations such as the Scarborough Zoning District, the Scarborough Shoreland Zoning District, the FEMA flood, plan, uh, flood Zone, which I had in my letter at A2 Elevation 11, which is A01. There was a confusion, if you remember when I came here last time about that designation. It's also affected by the frontal dune regulations, erosion hazard area, the Department of DEP, and the highest annual hat, uh, tie, uh, tide or the hat line. And that is primarily the reason why we're in here for the variance is the setback from the hat line, 75 feet. <coughs> the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance allows for replacement of an existing structure if the proposal conforms to Section 15B or a variance is granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals under 16G. The ordinance also permits the structure to be increased in size up to 30% in square footage and volume, and to be relocated to conform to the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. The proposed building size and location satisfies these requirements. Uh, the existing building has a concrete block, no, talking the existing building, has a concrete block foundation with a crawl space. The Shoreland Zoning Ordinance section requires the lowest floor elevation to be elevated at least one foot above the 100-year floodplain. Currently, that does not do that. So the existing building is in violation of the setback and the flood zone, as well as sideline setbacks. The DEP allows for the replacement of buildings under Chapter 355, Section 6D of the Coastal Sand Dune Rules. And that section states 
that all buildings modified or reconstruction must, reconstructed must have the lowest portion of the structural members of the lowest floor constructed on a post and piling foundation and be elevated at least three feet above the highest natural elevation around the building. Now that would mean if anything takes place on the existing building, it would have to be raised up with pilings put under it according to DEP. <clears throat> the existing flood zone, which is the AO, and is proposed to be changed to a VE elevation 15. It is advisable to establish a finished floor elevation of the replacement building that would satisfy the proposed flood line, which would be several feet higher than the current line that's there now. In the VE zone, the lowest portion of structural members of the lowest floor must be a minimum of one foot above the flood line. This results in a finished floor elevation of 18 feet, and we're proposing a finished floor at 18 foot 11 inches. The proposed replacement building design has received approval for compliance with the CDCR1 character based zoning district requirements. The administ administrative reveal was approved <coughs> substantially compliant with Chapter 405 uh, by letter from the Planning and Code Enforcement March 26 of this year. Now, the existing building is 28 foot wide, 36 four inches long. The proposed building would be 28 foot by 34 foot, in other words, two foot, four inches shorter. The ocean front wall of the proposed building will be located six feet further inland than the existing building, and the ocean side deck will be located eight inches in further than the existing building front wall. <clears throat> the proposed building relocation will satisfy the side yard setbacks of eight, eight feet, and the rear yard or the front yard side of 18 feet. However, we're still within the 75 foot setback from the half line. The floor area of the existing building is about 1,499 feet. The proposed uh, building will be 1,948 square feet and we're allowed 1,949 square feet. So we meet the 30% on that. We also meet the 30% on volume calculations. The existing building is 12,900 cubic feet. We're allowed to go to 16,777 and we're proposing 16,775. So we just make that also. The utilization of the existing building on a concrete block foundation. You have to look at this because if we're applying for a variance, <coughs> we have to show a need. And this next section is to show that we can't use the existing building uh, because that building's on a concrete block foundation and installing a second floor by means of a vertical expansion as an option is problematic. The Shoreland Zoning Ordinance and the CDCR1 zone allow for this with limitations. However, the DEP requirements are more restrictive. In the Coastal Sand Dune Rules, it states a new structure or addition to an existing structure may not be constructed on a seawood of the frontal dune. This is on the frontal dune. So a vertical expansion by DEP would not be allowed without going through the exception, which is in section 6B4, that says <clears throat> on a frontal dune, all buildings modified or reconstructed must have the flo lowest floor constructed on a post and piling foundation. So if the existing building was to be just expanded vertically, We'd have to eliminate the whole foundation and raise it up with posts and pilings. In order to install a wood piling support system that would meet the DEP requirements, the existing building would need to be removed so that the piles could be installed. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a sore throat today. Because of the lot size and lack of space between the property and adjacent buildings, the existing building cannot be removed from site. The Scarborough Shoreline Ordinance and the DEP allow for a replacement and expansion of a building that meets the standards and requirements of their respective ordinances and rules. An application of, for the proposed replacement building has been filed with DEP, and we do have another meeting with them next week, pending, uh, so the decision is still pending. However, a variance is required from the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals to demolish 
the existing building and replace it with a proposed building as shown on the attached plans. Attached plans. An approval of this variance request does not mean that the proposed building replacement can begin. The project is still subject to the DEP action and a building permit cannot be issued until a proposal is approved at the DEP level. So that's a little introductory of what we are going through. Right. We got a building that uh, if it stayed there would be just that, would stay like it is. And once the new zone comes through, you couldn't do anything to it. And so we're trying to get the variance approved to tear it down, relocate it, which then would meet all the requirements of section 15B for the replacement of the structure, with the exception it's still in the hat zone. But a relocation of a building that's within the hat zone can be accomplished as long as it's relocated further back from the water, or in this case the ocean, that is practically possible. And we have to maintain 18 foot from the rear line to the building, which is being called the front line. So the building relocation is set back as far as possible. And the new proposed building, like I say, would meet all the requirements, <clears throat> except the hat line problem, which we are reducing the nonconformity of it now. Another way of looking at it also is <clears throat> By granting the variance to do that, so that we can comply with most of the um, non-conforming aspects of the building, um, the proposed new structure would meet all those requirements, including floor elevations, side setbacks, front setbacks, square footage, uh, volume increase, and everything. Whereas if the existing building was not granted the variance to be demolished, it would result in the building becoming more non-conforming in the future once the V zone was put in and the flood zone was increased. So uh, trying to avoid becoming more non-conforming, the applicant is willing to invest in the building that protects its property as well as abutting properties from any uh, wave action or, or destruction that may occur from uh, uh, building products slashing against other houses. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a lot of information. Does the board have any initial questions before we get into the, before I have Mr. Wilson go through the requirements here? I have a point, one question. Do you have the existing building elevation, height elevation? I don't see that on here. It's on the site plan. The existing floor elevation is 12.8. Uh, yeah, build, building height. That's building height? R roof That's height. finished floor elevation. Sorry, I apologize. I meant um, roof height. The roof height. From grade. I don't think I have a direct measurement on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, unless it's on the... Let me check. Well, by a little interpretation here. <clears throat> two feet, ten two, seventeen two, seventeen foot six above the ground. Based okay. on the rear elevation on page one. Good enough. Thanks. Thank you. Appeal. We have some qualifications and questions that we're going to go through, and I'll have you if you want to just read the answers that you provided. And if the board has questions as we go along, just let me know. Um, so first, the proposed structure or use would meet the provisions of Section 15, except for the specific provisions which have created the non-conformity and from which relief is sought. waiting for me on that. Yes. Oh, I thought you were asking Brian. No, nope, I'm sorry. You can just read uh, your answer in there. <clears throat> the property is located within the 75 foot setback from the hat line. Actually, the whole building site is. The existing building is to be demolished and replaced with a building is proposed 
<coughs> that meets the provision of uh, section 16, uh, 15. The proposed building will be located further inland from the resource, but still within the hat line setback because of the limited depth of the property. This setback results with, in the non-conformity which the applicant is requesting relief from. Other than that, it meets all the requirements. That in lot, lot size. That in the lot yeah. size. Nah. Okay. They can't do anything about. Can't do anything about the lot size. <laughs> right. Well, those are grandfathered, so I, we already meet those. Okay. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean the maximum return. The applicant must demonstrate the practical loss in the virtual, virtually of all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. Okay, as always, this is the more complicated part of the uh, variance to, to answer. And in this case, it is quite complicated although in my mind is very simple. Uh, the proposed replacement building meets the requirements of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. I'm talking the proposed ones. This includes building size that allows for 30% expansion, floor elevation for the flood zone levels, relocation and position of the building on the site, building setbacks and so forth. The proposal is in compliance with the Higgins Beach character-based zone and has received approval from the town of Scarborough through the administrative review. Now the existing building is non-conforming in location, floor elevation, type of foundation, and compliance with the CDCR1 character ordinance. The proposed, the proposed replacement building will not be, will be more conforming, that is, and is designed to meet the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance as well as the requirements of the DEP for coastal sand dune, replacement in frontal dunes, the erosion hazard area standards, as well as the FEMA floodplain requirements for both the existing A zone and the proposed future VE elevation 15 zone. <clears throat> the DEP and the FEMA are proposing a change in the flood zone along the coastal properties that is projected to take place in the near future. This will affect this property. The existing A zone designation will be changed to that VE zone. This change will have great impact on the usability of the property. The existing A zone and frontal dune re regulations allow for the existing building to remain, to be relocated, replaced, elevated, increased in size by 30%, complying with specific governing conditions. Once this land is included in the V zone, the DEP and the FEMA regulations change dramatically. Chapter 355 of the Coastal Sand Dune Rules of the DEP National Resource Protection Act, Section C, states construction in V zones. No new structure or addition to an existing structure, including a vertical addition, may be constructed in a V zone. A building in a V zone may only be reconstructed under 16D it if, it's, if it is involuntar involuntarily severely damaged by fire or some other force majeure not to include wave action from an ocean storm. So if the existing building was to remain there, and if DEP is right in the flood elevations, good chance for this building to be knocked down by waves. In that case, it could even be rebuilt. This means that the existing building would have to remain as is it would become more non-conforming in respect to the floodplain elevation. The owner will then lose the ability to expand, replace, or relocate the building <clears throat> under normal circumstances. The reclassification of the land into a V zone will reduce the reasonable return on the land which has been enjoyed over the years. The proposal being brought forward under the current regulations that have been placed on the land <clears throat> allow for the replacement building to be built according to the applicable sections of the governing ordinances and regulations. The proposed building will be elevated on wood pilings that allow for the free flow of water over the land and will be more conforming than the existing building. The proposal will also reduce the possibility of damage <coughs> due to ocean storms to the building 
into other buildings in the neighborhood from any debris field. The Sherling zoning ordinance prohibits new structures, new structures for residential uses within the <coughs> resource protection area. However, the ordinance does allow for expansion, replacement, relocation of existing buildings according to section 12 of nonconformance. A strict application of the ordinance to state the residential structures are prohibited on this property would deny the owner the, <coughs> the opportunity to proceed with a proposed project utilizing provisions otherwise stated within the ordinance. <coughs> In section one, purposes of the ordinance states, the purpose of this ordinance purposes of this ordinance are to further the maintenance of safe and, he and healthful conditions, to protect buildings and lands from flooding and accelerated erosion, to control building sites, placement of structures and land uses, and to anticipate and respond to the impacts of development in shoreland areas. Also section 12A, it says that it, it is the intent of this ordinance to promote land use conformities, except that non-conforming conditions that existed before the effective date of the ordinance shall be allowed to continue subject to requirements set forth in section 12. Except as otherwise provided in the ordinance, a non-conforming condition shall not be permitted to become more non-conforming. You've got to think about this for a minute. If the variance is denied, that's essentially saying that the building will become more non-conforming when FEMA comes through. So it's kind of like a flip on the normal reading of that. The proposal before you is to replace the existing building, elevate the new building on piles to satisfy the floodplain, relocate the building to conform to the building setbacks to the greatest extent possible, and to conform to the CDCR1 character-based ordinance. In other words, if this variance is approved, the proposed improvements will be more, non will be more conforming to the regulations of the various ordinances and reflect the purposes in the shoreland zoning as expressed in section one and section 12 above. Because of all the limitations that have been overlaid onto this property, which primarily affects the use and limitations of the property, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance to remove and replace the existing building is, grandfathered, is granted before the newly proposed FEMA maps with a V zone designation uh, put into effect. What is the house currently used as? Residence. My primary residence? Yes. Okay. What is the overall condition of the house? Overall conditions, I would say, would be fair to average. I mean, the roof's not caving in, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at it from the standpoint of compliance with the uh, uh, regulations for uh, setbacks, elevations, and all that, is in completely non-compliant with any of that. Right. Does it currently have a deck on the front of it? No deck, no. Okay. No. And that's another thing, when, you, when, when you're looking at DEP, I could look at it and pull it out. The square footages that DEP looks at uh, for the building walls itself and does not include the deck. But with the uh, Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, we had to include the square footage of the deck along with the square footage of the house and not, not exceed the 30%. So from a DEP standpoint, the deck doesn't even count for square footage. So, so I'm sorry, and the deck is th included in the square footage yes, that you is. provided here? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. The, the stairs off the deck, I must say this, the stairs coming off the deck are not included, okay? Because access to the property is, is you have to have it. So that's not included. Well, does, isn't, isn't the, my question is, is the deck counted in as part of the overall footprint of the building? I believe it is. Like I said, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. With DEP, it does not. With the town of Scarborough, it does. Okay. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair, just yes. a point of clarification. Mm -hmm. 
Did I, did I hear Mr. Wilson say that this was a primary residence? No, yeah. I said it's it was a residence. It's just a residence. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said primary. I did no. too. That's what no. I thought. I, I said a residence. Okay. So is it rented out in the summers or what is it? I don't know if it's rented the at all, is it? Well, yeah, I'm Mike Fitzgerald, trustee of the Champion Trust, right? So about five weeks in the summer. All right, number two, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. And this applies to the property, not the people or to the uncommon condition not shared by the neighborhood. The variance requests an approval to demolish the existing building in order to locate a replacement structure on the property. The construction work will require a wood pile support system. It is not possible to install the pilings on the property without removing the existing building. The property does not have frontage on an existing street and the distance between the buildings on adjacent properties is not sufficient to have the building removed and returned from the site. This property's unique circumstances of size, lack of sufficient access to the street and building locations of the neighbor's buildings create a need for a variance in order to demolish and replace the building on a wood pile foundation. The right of way on this property going from the property to the street is 10 feet wide. The building is 28 feet wide. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of coming in with a flatbed, jacking that thing up and turning it around and coming out over a 10 foot wide right of way. So the building as it is now is kind of like landlocked from a street and also landlocked from being able to be taken off the property. Right. So we're in a situation where the best thing to do to satisfy as much of the conditions as possible is to tear the building down and relocate with a new replacement building. Okay. Number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. And when we talk about essential character, we talk about the characteristics of the neighborhood, such as the density, development, large open space, and rural. The proposed building design has received approval for compliance with the character-based zoning in Higgins Beach. The administrative review gave approval for the size, shape, and overall design of the proposed building as meeting the essential character of Higgins Beach locality. And if you were to look at the house right adjacent next to this, it's basically the same house as what's next door. The two, this house and the house that was next door uh, were referred to as the twin sisters. Both houses were exactly the same size, exactly the same shape, and one from the other was undistinguishable. The other building next door received permission to tear down and relocate on pilings with a design very similar to this. And it probably would have been exactly the same, except in the meantime, in the last year, there was a change in the Higgins Beach character ordinance where I had to change the roof lines to adopt to the new provisions. But other than that, if you look at the pictures right there, the house on the left was the original house that was torn down and uh, rebuilt. And right behind that in the tan color is the house that we're talking about now uh, to be torn down and rebuilt. Number four. The hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner of the property. The hardship that this proposal is asking relief from is a result of restrictions and regulations that have been placed on the property by the Shoreland Zoning, DEP, FEMA, Front of Doom, Erosion Hazard Ordinances. The hardship is not a result of action taken by the owner or prior owner. Okay. Does the board have any questions at this time? Excuse me, uh, Chair? Yes. I don't know if it's time yet, but has there been any letters regarding this? Uh, we'll, we'll do that when we do it to the okay. open it up to the Thank public you. forum. Yep. I have one question. Absolutely. Oops. Uh, how long has the applicant owned the property? 66. Uh, they bought, I'm the OS and I'm in. Four Champion Street, and uh, 
our families together bought the property in 1971. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm right. The house was built in 66. They purchased in 71. And it is now in the trust with the family. So under the current ordinance, can they expand the property now? Are you saying they don't have the right height? Well, it, com it becomes very tricky because the ordinance allows for a vertical expansion right now. Okay. So doesn't DEP. The problem is that when you do more than 50% of the value of the structure under DEP, you have to comply with the ordinances for that area. That ordinance requires it to be put on wood pilings. Now, there's no way you're gonna be able to put it on wood pilings with the building still there. You gotta move the building out of the way to put the pilings in. So with that said, then you gotta raise it up to meet the flood level. So then you'd have to try to take the existing building, raise it up, get it off the site, come in and put the pilings in, and then bring the building back and put it up. And you just can't get the building off the site on a 10 foot right away when the building's 28 feet wide and the houses are so close to each other, you can't make it, get the building in and out. So with that said, yes, you can but then you have to look forward. And it would be foolish to put all that money into it just to raise it up to meet the current flood zone when everyone knows the FEMA maps are coming through and they're gonna be raising it up another five feet. So you'd have to raise the, the building up another five feet. Now the existing structure, if you raised it up, put the pilings in, got it back in somehow and could do it, which I, I don't believe you can, you have to take the whole roof off in order to put the second floor. So what do you get left? You got four exterior walls. that are only two by four construction, two foot on center. Very, very likely not strong enough to hold the second floor addition. So then you're into redoing all the floors on the first floor. You end up putting more money into revamping the existing building, tearing the roof off, than what it costs to frame a new one. So can you do it? I suppose you could. You're, if you could get the building off the lot, which I don't believe you can. Okay, maybe I misunderstood Mr. Longstaff. I didn't realize it was not the height, it's the pilings, it's what's holding it up. As Mr. Wilson said, when, whenever, I, I guess the, the, the basic question is, the appellant wants to increase living space. In order to increase living space, the only way he can go is up. He can't expand the footprint, so it's gotta go up. Once you go up, you have to put piers, posts, or pilings in per DEP sand dune regulations. Gotcha. So it's a catch-22 situation. Yep. Yeah, you're also involved with the structural integrity of the building. Right. You've got to put in shear walls, exterior brace walls. You've got metal uh, um, plates to put in. Um, the existing building has none of that now, whereas the new one would. board has any other questions before I open it up to the public here's one one last one I have um, and you said because uh, the DEP requires it if um, the renovations to the building are more than 50% than its value did I yes. get that correctly that's in DEP regulation if you want me to dig it out I probably no can that's fine that's fine I'm good thanks Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna open it up to the public. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to speak tonight on behalf of this appeal. Did we receive any letters or phone calls? No. Nope. No, Madam Chair, we did not. Okay. Okay, well then I will go ahead and close the public hearing. And now the board is going to discuss the application and do our findings of facts and conclusions of law. So, number one, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. So Mr. Wilson has testified tonight that it's a non-conforming lot with 0.12 acres. 
That's in the shoreland overland zone, special flood area, frontal dune, erosion area, which is to increase the living space in the existing structure within the allowable 30% area. The preliminary FEMA maps place this property in a BE 15 special flood hazard area. The main DEP dune regulations prohibit the replacement of an existing structure unless it is severely damaged by the ocean storms. Yep. The town cannot predict when the maps will be effective. So tonight the applicant has testified that the property cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Ms. Torrens. Um, I believe that you have to define reasonable return, and I don't think this is just a financial gain. I think this is the ability to continue use of the property in a safe um, and habitable uh, manner. And um, I, I'm con convinced that there's valid reasons for, for doing this in order to continue um, you know, continue, uh, using the property in the way that it's been been used and um, you know and I do think it's reasonable to expand their 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 uh, thirty percent allowance. Um, I, I think that everything I've seen tonight says that there is a practical loss if it if they're not permitted to do this. Mr. Karen. With regard to the definition for the reasonable return. I um, have heard tonight that the building on occasion does get rented, whether it's seasonal. Um, currently, the building itself is in fair to average condition. Uh, the roof isn't caving in. No signs of damage from storms. Um, I also did, and I may have misunderstood, but the adjacent property was at some point reconstructed in yeah, this a year ago. A year ago. Um, is it permitted to ask a question? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, you can ask me. <laughs> uh, it's so that's, that's sort of where I am at. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hebert. Um, and again, this is the hardest question to answer on this one, because um, the applicant must dem demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted, and reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstance of the applicant. And my, my issue I have there is loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land. Um, I, I think there's a, another avenue that they could potentially take here. With regard to, and, and I mentioned this earlier, with regard to the front deck of the home, um, regardless if each neighbor, one neighbor has a deck and the other neighbor does not have a deck, um, the applicant is stating that there's gonna be a slightly <laughs> smaller footprint to the building. And my, my interpretation of looking at the building plans based on all the wood pilings that are in place, that the footprint's actually going to get larger. Because um, you're looking at Let's see a uh, 30 on the proposed replacement building location is a dimension of 34 feet from front to back. But if you add in the deck, and if you look at the elevation, there's the same wood pilings that's supporting the structure. And so my issue with it is that um, the footprint's actually getting larger and doesn't does not necessarily have to. We're looking. Uh, there is not. Virtually, the, the land in question can't yield a reasonable return. It's not, um, we're not looking for maximum return on this either. So there's interpretation there as well that makes this question very tricky, uh, as the applicant, applicant st stated. Um, so I have a hard time with this question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Bork? Uh, yeah, my interpretation of reasonable return is a little bit different. Uh, I look at this in terms of not maximum return, which I read. It does not have to be maximum return, but rather in terms of uh, loss and a reasonable return, meaning avoiding loss, in this case, doing nothing, could be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And 
by making this change, it'll, it'll bring the building in closer compliance to all regulations. Uh, and I think that that investment uh, is very reasonable compared to uh, attempting to rebuild the existing uh, building, you know, go up with it, which would be extremely expensive. You basically have to demolish the building to do anything. And it just, that's just not practical at all. So I, I, I see this in, in terms of what's the most practical way of being able to uh, continue to use this property in, into the future, given the fact that you've got regulations that are changing, and any kind of severe storm could render this property totally useless. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think that uh, this is a smart uh, investment, and uh, it's something that makes a lot of sense to me. It's the best course of action to take. <clears throat> Mr. Howell? to the board. Ms. Waters? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think I've discussed this is one of the hardest ones to overcome. I'm having a hard time kind of really grasping at the evidence that you've presented tonight that tells me that you can't get a reasonable return with what you're doing right now. Um, I mean, you, you're, you have testified that you currently have the house rented out, that it's not unsafe. I know that Mr. Wilson has been before us before and has presented pictures and evidence of how dilapidated the house is. And I know maybe some board members haven't been here long enough to know that, but in the past, typically we get evidence that kind of show us why and demonstrate to us why they're virtually losing all use of this property. I mean, it says you must demonstrate a practical loss of virtually all reasonable use. You came here tonight and you said you use it as a residence, you're renting it out, and you're going to continue to do it that way. Uh, I personally, I mean, I don't see the evidence here tonight, and maybe if someone on the board wants to correct me and show me something specific that they're showing, that would show um, I understand the threat of storms in the future and things like that, but that's not part of what the criteria is for what we're looking at right now. Um, so what we're going to do is take a vote on, yes. Actually, can, can I add something to my, my comment? Absolutely. Um, again, we're looking at, uh, currently it's a, a one-story one building with a finished loft and a lavatory. Um, there are four bedrooms here. Uh, the proposed house is a first and second floor and a, and a loft with a half bathroom lavatory. Um, so there, one option here is they could recreate the same building in the same footprint without expanding the footprint and they could do it that way rather than, it, and again, nothing saying that they can't get their maximum return on it, but I'm looking at this again virtually a virtual loss of all reasonable use of this property if they don't do this particular design. Mm -hmm. And I do not believe that is necessary. Also, one thing is FEMA's been sort of uh, bantered about for the last three, four, five years. Is when is this going to get approved? When is this going to get approved? And I don't believe that we should be approving applications based on something that hasn't been approved or instituted yet by FEMA. Um, once that does come into place, then yes, maybe we should take a look at it. Well, then but maybe you can reevaluate the whole reasonable return if FEMA does, in fact, put more restrictions on it. Yeah, if they could, change, they, they could change their mind. It hasn't been set in stone yet, so anything could change, especially when it comes to a government organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just, don't, we just don't know. So, again, that's, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Mr. Bork? I'd like Sometime. to amend my comments also. Uh, I, th I think what the, the applicant is asking for is something is strict that falls completely within the existing code for uh, expansion of 30%. This, mm -hmm. is, this is not any more than what's already allowed, uh, which I think is, is totally reasonable. Uh, so if we're strictly looking here in terms of what's the best way to deal with this problem property right now, uh, it's, it's not code compliant in terms of uh, the current standards, you know, not just the, the township's standards, but FEMA, everything else, it does not fall within current uh, standards. And what the applicant is proposing here is to bring it up to standards and at the same time to increase the size of it in a manner which is totally compliant with what he's permitted to do. I don't think that's anything unreasonable at all. And again, in terms of looking at this strictly in terms of, um, of you know, the, the financial aspect of it, this is the most cost-effective way 
of being able to bring it to standards. And you know, I totally agree with what the applicant is saying here, that it does not make any sense at all to continue the property with the, the property the way it is, and there, there really isn't any reasonable recourse in terms of bringing this property up to standards. And, he's, and in doing so, you know, it's, there's nothing exorbitant being proposed here. It's consistent with what's already been done in the, in the neighborhood, including a, a, a property adjacent to it mm -hmm. that was approved by a different board a year ago. So I know we can't, you know, you know go on precedent. However, no, I can't. think we have to, you know, look at, you know, what's the, what, the, what the standards are in that particular neighborhood. Well, we're looking at the standards and what the standards are for a variance appeal. So we're actually pretty strict here. And one of the things that I was saying kind of is that, you know, sometimes people come before us and as sympathetic as we are, we're sort of bound by this. I think what they're proposing is a great idea. But what it needs to do is meet the requirements here. And they mean, for me, I'm not seeing evidence of that. And I'm asking the board to show me like hard evidence here that they're showing that they can't do a reasonable return and continue to operate the way they are. Um, no, I agree with that. At the same time, I think that what the applicant is asking for is something that it's already permitted within the current township standards in this neighborhood. The building isn't falling apart yet, though. Uh, I mean, the applicant said, like, the roof is in okay shape. It's not going to fall into the sea this year. Um, I, I would wait until, the fi until FEMA is finalized. Like, these standards that, again, we keep referring to, they don't exist yet until they're adopted by the state and they could change. And our job as a board is to, is to look at all the evidence they've presented to us tonight that tells us that they are losing all reasonable use of the land. Oh. Um, and I under, yeah. understand what they're planning is a good idea, but at the current time, they have, no, they have, they have their property and they're using it and there's no loss. I think we're possibly look, putting FEMA too, into this too much. Mm -hmm. And if you just pull that out, and say, what if this were in some other neighborhood in the town? And, what, and the applicant were before us asking for you know, a permission to expand the property by 30%. I think it would be a no-brainer. I mean, that's, it's a reasonable request. Right? right, but we're really trying to stick to the question number one here. And, and it is reasonable return, and I, and I understand that. But I, I, just don't see the, I just don't see where there's a problem okay. at all. <clears throat> Anyone else? Can I make a couple of clarifications on something that was said during discussion? I know it's discussion time. Briefly, sure. Okay. The idea of taking the existing building, tearing down, and rebuild the same building, can't do. It doesn't comply with the character ordinance. It wouldn't get approval to do that. Yep. Okay, that's number one. Number two, if I could read the definition of footprint uh, from the DEP. Well, we're not worried about the details of that. I mean, it we're, we're specifically really said this porch is not considered when determining a building's put, a footprint. Yeah. But that's DEP, though. Yeah, and I, I, yeah. I mean, we're just talking about reasonable returns right now and practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land. Um, and I think so. Um, unless, Mr. Karen? And just to amend my previous comment, uh, I am also sympathetic and understand that from a financial standpoint, there are certain benefits to the proposed plan. Um, but within the current restrictions and the wording of this question with reasonable return, um, that's once again where I am tied up. Uh, going back to another previous comment is that there is still wiggle room uh, with that 50% replacement value or um, existing value of the property that uh, while it's not great or uh, as great of a design as you've presented tonight, it's still a possibility. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, so let's take a vote on number one. All in favor of number one being met? That's two. Those opposed? And that's three. Number two, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. 
So I think we went over tonight the unique circumstances of the property. The standard lot size at Higgins Beach is 50 feet by 100 feet or 5,000 square feet. This lot is 24, 25 feet shorter and only 3,952 square feet. So this makes it a smaller lot. And it's too small and adjacent to dwellings to look to relocate the existing building while a new foundation is being installed as you testified tonight. The Shoreland Zoning Ordinance only allows a replacement dwelling to be constructed in conformity with the requirements of Section 15B unless a variance is granted by the Board of Appeals. Um, the applicant also sh showed us tonight that the under Section 15B the requirements <coughs> fish, sorry, Section B requires the building to be at least 75 feet landward of the highest annual tide and the existing building is entirely within the 75 foot setback with no location on the lot where it would not enroach on the setback. Ms. Torrens? I think this one goes, um, it's pretty much a no-brainer that the unique circumstances of the property are, are what's forcing this, this, this type of plan. Um, I mean, I, I just think that this one's been met quite easily. I agree. Uh, I believe this one is clearly met based on the location and the current restrictions and um, current standards and ordinances of the town. I agree based on the current standards and the uniqueness of this property and its location within the shoreland zone that um, it is certainly due to the unique circumstance of the property. Agreed. <clears throat> okay, all in favor of two being met. Number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, so the existing dwelling is a single-story family structure that has, as you said, has a loft to the floor area above. And the proposed building will be a two-and-a-half-story building with a floor area of 1,949 square feet and a building height of over 34.5 feet. The proposed building has received approval pursuant to the design standards of the form of the base code for Higgins Beach, which helps to maintain the essential character of the elements of the building at Higgins Beach. So tonight the applicant has shown us presented that it would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, Ms. Torrens? Yeah, I think this one goes without saying, too. I, you know, I think you've taken great strides to try to make sure that it does comply with the character standards of the neighborhood. I also agree that it does comply with the adjacent properties and nearby neighborhood uh, in terms of the visual aesthetics and appearance as well as the one to two story height. I agree as well uh, that it meets the current uh, character codes and aesthetics of other houses in the neighborhood. Agreed. <coughs> I agree. Um, yeah, I think you've done a good job tonight and I think Mr. Wilson is before us very frequently in regards to coming in performance and creating houses in Higgins Beach and, and bringing them in conformance and following the code. So all in favor of three being met. Right. Number four, the hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner of the property. Yeah, I don't think you can blame the applicant for the fact that this this lot is not going to accommodate um, a change to improving the the building's structural integrity and and bringing it more into character um, and compliance with codes. I, you know, I think they're they're just caught in in a bad situation here. With regard to the prior owners, um, built in the '60s, there was knowledge and awareness of the uh, Atlantic Ocean and its proximity there too. Uh, however, building codes do change over time and become more restrictive and uh, the current hardship proposed I do not believe is due to the current owners. 
Similarly, I don't think that the hardship created here was by the applicants or their owners of the property. And I agree. I agree with that too. Um, so, like most of the properties at Higgins Beach, the property was developed in 1966 prior to the adoption of the Shoreland Zoning Dune Regulations or the Floodplain Management Ordinance. Um, this is one of the ones that I sort of struggle with. The hardship is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or the prior owner of the property. I, I'm not sure what has changed, but what has brought you before here today was, to me, the hardship is that the applicants want to simply make a change to their property. They're creating a hardship in a, in a situation that was already existing. Um, I'm not, I, it's just kind of a different sort of interpretation that I have sometimes of this, where if there was something that specifically happened that would bring them to us, I'm not really seeing any evidence here about something that has changed. I think most of the application in the introduction was in regards to changes that might be coming down the road, and I think we talked about that a little bit more. They're anticipating a hardship, um, but I, I'm not quite sure if the hardship is there right now. Um, so, I don't know if anyone else has anything else on number four. We can go ahead and vote on number four. All in favor of four being met. One, two, three, four. It's four and against one. Chairman, before we go on with a final vote, I'd like to make a proposal to table this till I can get some further information to get a satisfaction satisfaction from you on his hardship so I'd like to table this until I can get further information and also to clarify some of the missed things that were stated during destruction destruction which are not correct Wow. okay <clears throat> so we just went through the whole application process and we're about to vote on this and the applicant has asked to table a motion to table Second. All in favor. Against. I'll get some information to clarify some of the things that I, I understand may have influenced the decision on certain things which may have been based on erroneous information or okay. understanding. Okay. One more appeal tonight. Um, I don't. I don't. What, what's the appeal number? Well, the property is 20 Dillon Drive. All right. Appeal number 2664. First, I'm going to have Mr. Longstaff do a quick introduction on the town's background and what this appeal is, and then we'll ask you to present. Oh, sure. So uh, the appellant. The appellant. Uh, Mr. Finkelstein has, uh, at the time of the application, had a purchase and sales agreement. I don't know if you've now closed yes, on the property. Yes, so and, and I have the, uh, the closing uh, you, documents. You have closing documents, so yeah. he, he did have a right title and interest to apply. Um, a brand new home in Leighton Farm subdivision. Uh, Mr. Finkelstein is a uh, uh, psychological counselor. He's operated a business elsewhere for uh, many many years wants to now be able to do it out of his home in a basement it's not going to be it's not going to increase the footprint of the house uh, it's going to be completely contained within the house um, in our ordinance home occupations are a special exception use which then has to be approved by the Board of Appeals uh, there are certain criteria under special exceptions in section 4i and then there are additional criteria in the home occupation performance standards in section 9v and uh, so as as the board reviews your case they'll they'll ask you about all of those various standards to see if you meet them and if you do then the, the uh, uh, your special exception use would be approved if you don't then it would be denied 
Okay. <coughs> well, uh, I don't know if you want me to go over the answers to all these. Uh, we can dive right into the questions. Sometimes pe people like to give a big background, but uh, we've also been here for good hours. Um, uh, if you want, we can dive into the questions. We can. Whatever you prefer. I, uh, uh, there were, uh, I looked over the uh, requirements for home occupation and it appears that uh, whatever it is that I do is in compliance uh, with those. Uh, I could go over the uh, details with it. Uh, uh, the uh, proposal use will not create an unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage. Uh, the office will have one bathroom using current city sewage. There'd be no other emissions to air or water. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read the questions to you. Oh, okay. So you don't, so you don't have Please. to read everything. Fine. <laughs> well, I, I was just following. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know don't, any of don't those do sections. And <laughs> um, so B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. That's correct. Okay. So you wrote down here that there will be approximately 15 clients a week entering the property? About parking. Um, under number B, under B, letter yes. B, you said that, that you put the approximately 15 clients a week entering the property for which parking will be available in the existing residential driveway. Uh, correct. Um, I, uh, my uh, uh, therapy hour is uh, 45 to 50 minutes. And there is uh, be uh, uh, our driveway, and my car will be in the garage. And so there's a space where my car will be, and I'm not going anywhere. I had a similar situation like that in my uh, current office, where I've been for 33 years. Uh, we had uh, five residential uh, apartments and uh, three consulting rooms and eight parking spaces. So uh, I uh, always uh, notified my patients uh, to park behind my car because I wasn't going anywhere. And there was uh, usually enough time uh, in between the termination of one session and the beginning of another. So, uh, and uh, if anyone came early, they were instructed to either just wait until my uh, last client left. So uh, parking should be no problem at all. We should be able to use my driveway uh, 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 for all clients coming in. Right, and you only have one coming at a time. It's only one at a time. Or coming at once. <laughs> C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems for which would be substantially different from those created by the existing uses in the neighborhood or require substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. That's correct. I mean, it's, uh, the, the usage of the property would be similar to anyone having visitors or guests coming to their home. Exactly, yep. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on the water supply. No. <laughs> I don't think so. E, the proposed use will not, will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Yeah, the proposed use will occur in its entirety, uh, entirely internally, and its external appearance will be no different than those of the other residential structures in the neighborhood. And F is if it's located in a shoreland zone. Are you located in a shoreland zone? Unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> I can verify that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't know if the board had any questions before we get into the specific <clears throat> performance standards for a home occupation. Still got something to go on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mine. Oh, I tried. G, the application has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Yes, we closed on the property last Friday, and we moved in Friday, <laughs> and we're still moving in. <laughs> And you'll continue to be moving. And we'll continue to move in. <laughs> 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 That's 
Um, H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this application. Mm -hmm. Well, I've operated a similar office for psychological counseling in the city of Portland, Maine for approximately 44 years. The proposed usage will be in full compliance with subsection 5. I don't remember what that was, actually, but I did look it up. <laughs> Performance standards, home occupations. And I, the proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Hours of operation are generally nine to five, uh, three days a week. I see uh, clients on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Okay, that's it. Any questions before I get to the standards? Yeah, there was one other uh, requirement that I did look up and that uh, the uh, total usage of the office uh, should not exceed 20% of the total right. uh, uh, square footage of the home. Uh, the uh, office space that I've broken down, uh, waiting room, office, bath, and hall, is 312 feet. Uh, the uh, the uh, first floor, our uh, residence, is a little over 1,800 square feet, so 20% would be 360 square feet plus, and I'm fully in compliance with that. Okay, that's one of the uh, performance standards that we're going to go through down right now. We got We have about 11 that we're going to do. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I'll go through them, and you can just answer them the best you can. Um, the occupational profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal building or within a building accessory thereto. Yes. Two, the home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. That's correct. So our understanding is this is your new primary residence and you're just going to be operating three days a week out of it. Yes. Correct. Number three, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. I have no employees. Four, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions. Are you going to be doing a sign? Uh, I may just put a, uh, my uh, nameplate on the exterior door if that's right. permissible. Yeah, the town will give you guidelines on all that yeah. on how to do that. Five, there shall be no exterior displays, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of a home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building. This no. prohibit shall not apply to the storage of lobster traps. No, there won't be any. Six, no nuisance shall be generated, including but not necessarily limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odor, heat, glare. I hope not. <laughs> Seven, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume or traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or to disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. No, there shouldn't be any real change. What's, is this a new development? Excuse me? It's a new development? Yes. And so are there, what is the status of all the other homes? Are they and, built? Are the homes built? Uh, I think about 50 of them are built, and I think there's going to be about 30 more. So they're oh still gosh, in the process of developing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a lot. Cool. He doesn't have any neighbors to bother right now. So <laughs> <laughs> Eight, in addition to off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, adequate off-street parking shall be provided for vehicles of each employee and the vehicles of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak operating hours. Right, there wouldn't be any uh, a need to use uh, off-street parking. Right, we talked about that. You only have one patient at a time. Yes. And so this is the one we went into a little bit. The home occupation may utilize no more than 20% of the dwelling unit floor area provided that for the purpose of this calculation, the unfinished basement and attic spaces are not included. Correct. So, so I think you said before, you want to do that yes. again for us one more time? Yeah, uh, the uh, uh, total office space is 312 uh, square feet. Uh, I measured each portion of that uh, and the whole thing, and it came out to be the exact same number, so that was good. The waiting room is 10 by 12, the office is 10 by 12, bathroom is 6 by 7, and the hall is 6 by 5. 
uh, adds up a total of 312 square feet. Uh, the uh, total square footage of my residence is somewhat over 1,800 square feet. 20% uh, of that would be uh, 360 square feet, so I'm fully in compliance with the square footage requirements. Okay. Um, number 10, home occupations may include retail sales. Are you going to be doing any sort of retail sales? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, number 11 applies to fishermen, lobsters, or shellfish harvesters, and that is not you. No. Not and sure. number 12 is a motor vehicle repair or towing company, which is not no. you as well. So. I can't even do my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if the board has any questions for the applicant at this time. Um, I don't know. It seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, Mr. Just Karen. a couple questions yeah. about the new development. Uh, first question is, is the home sprinkled, uh, protected sprinklers? Uh, no, I don't have that. We're actually planning on putting that in. <coughs> and just looking at the plans provided, uh, is it the intent that to access the office and the waiting room, the entrance is through the front door or through the garage? No, it is a, a dog house. And uh, actually all the homes and Leighton Farms have a dog house and a staircase to the basement, and that will be used by my clients. Okay, thank you. Yeah. One piggyback question on that. Just don't want to, um, is, do you have a daylight basement where there's good egress out of the room that you'll be using? Uh, yes, it's, uh, uh, there's a, a large window in both the waiting area and my uh, consulting room as well. It must be about six by three feet. So we, and that was one of the reasons that I chose that lot because it allowed to have that kind of daylight basement. Excellent. Any, Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up. I mean, close the public, open it up to the public. You're going to open it. Yeah. Open it to the public. Open Sorry. Anyone would like to speak? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chris Chiazzo, 17 Elmwood Avenue. Um, I'm actually in the neighborhood um, that Leighton Farms is being developed. Um, I've been in the facility, or I should say the facility, I've been in the house. Um, it's uh, honestly, there's, there's minimal to, to any impact in the neighborhood at all. Um, we probably have a lot more traffic coming through based on the um, hospice uh, center that's nearby and uh, any kind of noise we're getting is from the connector. So um, there's really, uh, the, the development itself is in I think phase three of five. Okay. They're down in the far end closest to the Nunsuch. Um, they are still building over, uh, but certainly the character of the house is, it's uh, almost unnoticeable. And I think really the question would be, you know, are the neighbors gonna have concerns about it if they see different cars coming in? So I think maybe with some appropriate signage or something, uh, that, that, that shouldn't be an issue. So um, as a neighbor, I think um, it, it certainly is something that I think we should be attracting um, because it does bring a, a different kind of character to the neighborhood as well and certainly nothing that's too intrusive or overly impactful. So, thank you. Thank you. I don't know what you mean when you say character to the neighborhood. <laughs> 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 the building. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Longstaff, did you receive any emails? Or letters? We did not. We received no emails, calls, letters, postcards, or other communications. Raven. <laughs> no ravens. No ravens. <laughs> Good. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing, and the board's going to go through the criteria. Uh, I'd like to go through the performance standards first with the board and vote down these, and then we can go through the general special exception ones. Um, so, number one, the occupation or profession shall be carried out wholly within the principal building or within a building accessory there, too. Oh, thank you. Can I make a suggestion, Madam Chair? Yes. I, you may have already said this. If you just go down through the uh, performance standards, I, I think he's just answered them. I think you could probably take an up or down vote on whether all, all or yeah. any of the home uh, occupation standards have been 
not been met. Thank you. And just do an up or down vote. On yeah. the whole I, thing. I'm okay with that if the board is okay with that. I'm fine yes. with that. Okay. Absolutely. So that, that works. So let's, let's start at. You don't have to read them all. Right. No, we're going to. Okay. So do you guys just want to vote on the performance standards for the home occupation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor. Oh, no. We need a motion. No, we don't. No, we don't need a motion. Not a motion for that. No, we're just voting on that. Just, just. Yep. So all in favor of the performance standards for the home <laughs> occupation being met. He's not a lobster. <laughs> or a mechanic. Or a mechanic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So that was five. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was better. Uh, what is this? A. The proposed use will not create an unsanitary or unhealthful condition by reason of sewage disposal emission to the air, water, or other aspects of design or operation. Um, the applicant has testified tonight that the proposed use will be a counseling office in the basement that will not create any sort of unsanitary or unhealthful conditions. And he's going to be connected to public utilities, and he's only going to be operating three days a week, and he said between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5. Ms. Torrance. I believe that standard's been met. I have nothing further to add. Yeah, uh, it's one bathroom using city sewage, and it's going to be one person at a time, so it wouldn't be any different if they had an extra um, person living in the home, so there's no impact there. Agreed. Agreed, I don't see an impact. All right, there would be minimal impact, just like having a visitor over at the time. So all in favor of A being met. That's five. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when adding to the existing or foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Well, the applicant has shown that he's going to limit his hours to the operations to three days a week and only between 9 and 5 p.m., um, where most folks are probably out at work themselves. Um, so the, um, the driveway will accommodate up to two vehicles, and most so it will only be one vehicle at a time. Um, the applicant's dwelling is situated without a turnaround, so the traffic must back out onto Dillon Drive, um, but I think that there should be good visibility, we would think, in a new development like that. It's planned out pretty well. He's also on the side of the street that doesn't have a sidewalk, so that's that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Torrance. Again, I feel like this has been met adequately. I don't believe there's any additional um, vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions that will cause problems. I agree that the standard's been met. If uh, the weekly visitors are reoccurring, they would be understanding of the parking um, parking rules and guidelines at the property, parking behind a vehicle if uh, directed, and I do not see any issues with pedestrian traffic. Um, this one's always my concern with traffic, people going in and out with a home occupation, um, but uh, the, client, the applicant has uh, satisfactorily stated for my, uh, for my benefit um, 15 clients, three days a week. Um, there's a space in the driveway for them. So again, all, and the applicant said the, there's only gonna be one person at a time. Uh, it's confirmed by the town, the sidewalk isn't on that side of the street. So um, there's no real threat or danger posed to the public of anybody sort of walking by. I mean, everybody backs out of the driveway all the time. So it's not like they're gonna be 13 cars there waiting to get in. So I don't see an issue with this one. Agreed. I see more of an impact with FedEx and UPS deliveries. Than <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, I think the use that you're proposing here would not create any sort of unsafe vehicular pedestrian traffic. All in favor of B being met. See, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. Um, you know, the hours that they're proposing to see clients are during the daytime and shouldn't be substantially different than from when someone's at their house visiting and having a visitor over. I see that being. <clears throat> yeah, I see no, no, um, nothing that's out of the normal use of a res residential property here going on. 
I agree. I don't see any issues. Nothing more I perceive than a simple visitor or family member. I agree. I have nothing to add. No impact here. All in favor of C being met. That's fine. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect. Um, the activity does not involve any sort of outdoor element and does not expand the existing footprint of the structure, and it, so it will not have an effect, an adverse effect on the water supply or result in sedimentation. He's simply operating inside his building. Uh, Ms. Torrens? Yep, again, I see no actually no impact really whatsoever to uh, that would be any different than a, than um, the other residential structures in the neighborhood. Agree, nothing to add. I agree, I have nothing to add. Agreed. Agreed. All in favor of D being met? Either proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Um, the proposed use, will, I don't think, will have an adverse visual impact as it contains within the footprint of the existing permitted structure. Um, you know, it's, there's going to be really no visual impact besides the same as having them having a visitor over. It's not going to change any sort of proximities and things like that. I agree with the chair. I also agree that there will be no um, <coughs> issues with respect to the physical size as it's contained within a residential property and the plan development, visual impact, once again, um, nothing more than exterior, our proposed exterior sign on the doorway, intensity of use, um, same as a visitor, and proximity to other structures will remain as uh, within the neighborhood development. Uh, the house and the development look a little They'll, they'll look similar. Sorry, this light is bothering me. Um, <laughs> houses and development are very similarly built. Um, so that, yeah. you know, this, not, the, this aspect of the home where people are walking in isn't going to be that dissimilar, but that's going to stand out. Uh, also, the office is going to be in the basement, so um, there's not really going to be a lot of traffic in and around the property. So I have no issue with E being met. No impact. No, I see no impact. Okay, all in favor of E being met. Five. F. If located in the shoreland zone. I think all we can skip this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Shoreland zone. Um, G. The applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be carried out in the proposed use. The applicant has provided us with a purchase and sale agreement, and he has testified tonight that he did, in fact, purchase the property where he's going to be conducting his activity. Congratulations on your new home. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think you've got adequate title based on what I can see. I agree. Nothing more to add. Uh, I agree. They provided all the documentation. Agreed. Congratulations. All in favor of G being met. H. The applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. The applicant has testified tonight that he has 44 years of experience of running a similar counseling business in Portland and will comply with any reasonable conditions the Board will impose. I believe he has every ability to continue his practice there successfully. I think if he was able to operate a business for 44 years in, in Portland and successfully without having anybody complain and kick him out, then I think, I think we're probably good to go. <laughs> I agree. Uh, based on the information provided this evening, I have no concerns with this standard. I agree. I have nothing to add. Uh, this is a great example of a, of, of a good use of a home business in a residential area. Yes. Very much. All in favor of H being met. J, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. The applicant has proposed to schedule his clients between the hours of 9 and 5, which would only be three days a week. Um, I don't see that. Would, that seems pretty compatible to a resident just coming and going, uh, visitors and things like that. Ms. Torrens? 
I'm pretty sure if there were children in the neighborhood, they would be more annoying than, than this particular thing. <laughs> or more intrusive. Maybe I don't even know how to say that, but um, I, I think that this is, uh, this is gonna have minimal impact. I love kids too. I have a whole bunch of them. Apparently, Ms. Torrens has a problem with children. She may need to come see you. <laughs> we can ex I can get your business card out. <laughs> I see no concern with the standard. Uh, if the office is in the basement, that will help mitigate noise. Uh, it's three days a week between nine and five, and that'll generally be a quiet time during the day where most folks are out of town at work elsewhere. Again, very appropriate use of uh, home for business use. All right, so all in favor of I being that. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve appeal number 2664 as presented. All seconds. All in favor? That's five to zero. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, good luck. Welcome. Yes, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we have to have a motion to adjourn. This is the business that uh, Brian wants to bring up. Oh. <laughs> Good luck. That'll be fine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad our little conversation worked. A while ago. Yes. Not for this. A long time ago. A long time ago. A long time ago. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay, we, we're still alive. That's all right. Yeah, oh, we're still coming. That's all right. Sure. No. I don't. Thank you. Have a good night. It doesn't matter. That's fine. Um, was there any other business? No other Mr. business. Mr. Uh, Longstone. Other than to welcome our two our two new alternate members. Yeah. Yes. Um, welcome. Mr. Howe and, and Ms. Wallace. Uh, Walters. Waters. Walt Waters. Waters. I'm sorry. I knew I'd screw that up. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm really happy we have a full board for the first time in about two years so yes. thank you both this is super for, exciting uh, we're happy to have you guys here it's really important you guys are here because we do have a lot of members who have full-time jobs i think we all do and we all get busy and so uh, I mean, it's not uncommon that an alternate will be coming and showing up and voting that night um so stay involved thank i voted the first so night i was an alternate i voted the first night i was an alternate yeah. well i guess i wasn't an alternate right yeah um, Okay. Do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>